OK. So as you, you may have noticed, the course has been proceeding uh, somewhat historically, uh, first with pre-primate animals, the whole evolution of sex from things that swam in the ocean. Uh, and then we discussed the primate uh, <coughs> mating uh, system, as, as you've seen, uh, as in the same sense as on the board. And so the first, the, the pre-primate is uh, a few millions of years. Uh, I'm sorry, tens of millions of years. Primates, uh, maybe 10 uh, million years or so. And then last time we started discussing <laughs> the transition from ape to human and uh, evolutionarily modern human state to something like 150,000 years ago. So we're, move, we're coming up uh, to time. And today we're going to discuss fully anatomically modern humans. They have the same brain capacity that we do, et cetera, et cetera. The earliest groups that we have any kind of decent demographic data on are hunter-gatherers, which would include cavemen and, and people that are hunter-gatherers but do not uh, live in caves. And uh, last time we asked why there were so few chimps and so many humans, and today we're going to ask very uh, similar questions about, we're going to start with, we're going to cover a lot more, we're going to ask very similar questions about hunter-gatherers. Uh, there, were not, there never was a great density of hunter-gatherers. There is certainly not now. And the question is, why? Um, if you look where hunter-gatherers live now, they eat each small group. And again, the small group is the same size we've been talking about, something like 40, are spread out over a very large area. And they use that area to hunt in and to collect uh, fruits and nuts and, and whatever they can get uh, from the trees. And so it looks like a very simple question. Why is the density of hunter-gatherers so low? Why are there so few of them? Uh, and for a long time, uh, the answer was uh, they didn't have much food, that they needed all this space to get enough food uh, to survive. And if they overpopulated that space, they, they, they couldn't survive. And in sort of modern... Uh, hubris, we looked back and thought hunter-gatherers is a very inefficient form of food gathering, not modern, and uh, we're, we're so much better than them now. And uh, the data is uh, quite clear on, on some part of those assumptions. Uh, hunter-gatherers, uh, at the time when all human beings were in the stage of hunter-gatherers, uh, before Farming starts about 10,000 uh, years ago. Um, there's, uh, what is the number here? Uh, uh, there may have been like 2 million people on the whole Earth. Remember I said hunter-gatherers hunter spread out of Africa, spread amazingly over the whole of Earth, and maybe the total population of humans at that time was something like 2 million people. Now we have over 6 billion people that's a f an increase of 3,000 times in uh, the human population. So clearly, there were fewer hunter-gatherers than, than now. And this is a very, you'll see this in, in lots of discussions of, of this field, but it's a very elementary kind of consideration. It talks about the long scale of human demography, of human population growth. And we came out of being uh, other species of, of primate uh, of, of hominids, and our, we gradually grew up to some sort of a limit. There's the idea that the various in, uh, productive systems that we use, uh, like hunter-gathering, uh, limit is some sort of a carrying capacity limit. And so the idea is that the human population increased until it reached a limit, and then for a very long period of time, it can't get beyond that limit. And then 10,000 years ago, maybe it's 12,000, uh, farming is invented. And all of a sudden, the whole system changes. There's many more people. And we jump up and then again reach a limit. And we'll talk about that as a Malthusian limit in this particular uh, period. Later, we'll discuss that. And then uh, around here, uh, the Industrial Revolution happens. Uh, and all of a sudden, the population increases again. This is a logarithmic 
scale, so it's, it's not linear. Each of these jumps is by a factor of several thousand. Um, so that's a very, very uh, schematized version of, of human demographic history. And we're talking about this period. What limited hunter-gatherers to this level, whereas farmers could go up to this level? And again, uh, the obvious answer, uh, and, and looking at this kind of rough data, is that it was food. However, then uh, uh, archaeologists, paleontologists go and actually try to examine this, and there it turns out to be the data does not fit that theory uh, terribly well. So uh, what do archaeologists do? They dig up skeletons, and uh, they have a good representative uh, set of skeletons from the last 7,000 years in North and South America. And one study looked at more than 12,500 skeletons, so we're, we're talking about a, 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 a good uh, scientific sample. And what did they find out? These were set into communities, and communities lasted uh, so much time, so you can date the whole archaeological site to a certain period. And the, the medical anthropologists got into it and started looking at the bones and dentition and all this. And not only did they find the violence we talked about last time, but these people were also sick. They had diseases at different times. And you could see bone problems and how well the bones grew and from the teeth how much calcium they had and all this. And what does it turn out? That contrary to the idea of progress, that you think the later people were more healthy, in fact it was the earlier uh, people, uh, in, in the, uh, the earlier individuals that were healthier. And as time goes on, the skeletons get less and less healthy that they're getting less food and less good food and ha were more subject to diseases. It was quite a shocker when this data started uh, coming out. And the researchers attributed this decline in health, decline in health, in large part to the rise in agriculture. Two main factors, they had the rise of agriculture and the rise of urban living. And we'll talk about the urban story in a moment. Now, if you, again, go like we did last time from the archaeology to the anthropology and look at current hunter-gatherers, uh, it's a little bit of a distorted study because nowadays uh, almost all hunter-gatherers have been pushed out of the good lands that they used to live in into very marginal lands. You know this from U.S. history in high school, how the European farmers pushed the either very early farmers or, or hunter-gatherers of the American Indians, the Native Americans, into Arizona, into desert, into the badlands in the west, uh, the dry badlands into the west of the U.S. So farming peoples push uh, hunter-gatherers into inhospitable land. Uh, there's a story in the Smithsonian Magazine recently about uh, bush, uh, pygmies in, in Africa. And I don't know if you know a little bit about the history of African demography, which we'll also cover. But the Bantus have expanded from uh, southwest, the bulge of southwest Africa, basically all around, and have pushed other peoples out. And the pygmies are one of the groups that have been very severely discriminated against and really pushed uh, into inhospitable places. Another example is the Bushmen of, uh, of Africa, who were pushed into the Kalahari Desert in uh, southern Africa. But even in the desert, these guys eat 85 different species of plants. And it's almost inconceivable in their culture for someone to die of starvation. Because you know plants will bloom some years and not bloom some years. They'll get a fungus some year or a virus. Plants, are, any one species is not generally very reliable. When you have 85 different species to survive on, you're not going to go uh, without food. There will always be some uh, group of, of plants uh, that, that are going to be available to you, and, and so you're not going to starve. Further, the anthropologists live with these people, and they start you know, writing down what they're doing at every point in time. And per hour invested, the Bushmen get more food than the early agriculturalists. Not modern agriculturalists who can drive a tractor and in you know, an hour do a lot, but we're, we're comparing uh, uh, hunter-gatherers to the, the first stages of, of, of agriculture. And uh, the Kalahari, uh, the Bushmen in Kalahari spend 12 to 19 hours a week collecting food. And the rest of the time, they use for a lot more sleep 
than, than, than even current farmers, and a lot more leisure than farming peoples. So life is, is more generous to them. Um, and you have to think now, this is for people pushed into a desert, a very inhospitable place. And now if they, if you can imagine them living in a, in a lush uh, forest region where, where they, they originated, uh, life must have been e much, much easier. So the amount of time uh, exerted to get your basics of food and everything must have been, much have been a lot less. And not only uh, do they have to work less and uh, they get more food per hour, but the variety of foods is very good for you because you need different, miner uh, different minerals, you need different other micronutrients, you need different vitamins, and as we are bombarded with uh, uh, in the popular press, a variety of foods is, is very good for you. You don't want to eat uh, just one kind of food. So they had a very diverse and healthy kind of diet. Agriculture comes in, and indeed it enormously increases the amount of food, because per acre, when land is limiting, when you have a population density such that land becomes limiting rather than your time or your need, when land becomes limiting, then agriculture becomes important, because per acre you can get a lot more food than hunter-gathering, but you have to spend lots and lots of hours to get that land to give you uh, that amount of food. So, uh, the, the question uh, remains is, why are there so few, why uh, were there, and, and still are of course, why are there so few hunter-gatherers? That again, it's a Malthusian uh, type question, that if we know they lived quite well, we know that later people going to agriculture lived a lot less well in terms of, you know, basics of life, how come the hunter-gatherer population did not increase up to the same level of misery? <laughs> As, as early farmers, which is basically one of the earliest examples of a Malthusian-type uh, question. Malthus thought those same kind of thoughts, but for a much later uh, population. Uh, well, one, just a truth, we don't really know the answer to this, and it's greatly argued about, but I can tell you some things that are known. Uh, current hunter-gatherers uh, have a moderate number of children, and, they, and many survive. They do not have an enormous infant mortality, certainly not compared to later populations, which I'll show you, that have a huge uh, infant mortality. Uh, if they are nomadic, and I'll tell you about an example of that later, they have to move quite a lot. And that means carrying children around. And I think Bonnie has sort of indicated to you, even dealing with a lot of children in one place is, is difficult, but the difficulty of moving uh, with very young children, you know, packing up everything and moving for a very long time o over a long distance is difficult. And nomadic peoples uh, very often show very clear signs of some form of conscious population control. They know they can't cope with more than X number of children. Uh, we'll get to that all societies have indeed controlled their population, but by mechanism they were not totally, not clear what they think the reason for their doing things were, but uh, nomads uh, apparently know what they're doing. Hunter-gatherers are moderately healthy. Again, their, their burden of sickness is not, uh, is not severe, compar again, compared to later populations. And, however, parasites are always uh, a problem. And let me I'll show you again a modern case of parasites. This is a girl, modern girl, current girl, in Central America. And you may notice the swollen belly. You know what's inside there to swell it? Worms, exactly. And when they purge her, that was what was inside that girl. All the, those worms. So uh, humans have had this problem since time immemorial. Uh, Hunter-gatherers are not uh, immune to this. Infectious diseases they have less because they're in small groups. So infectious diseases, you know, need large groups to keep spreading. Uh, and they're hostile to their neighbors, just, just again like chimpanzees, so they don't come in a lot of contact with neighbors, so diseases don't spread from group to group, and each individual group is not large enough to uh, allow <coughs> for the maintenance of, of a disease. Um, each village, if you, it, you know, anthropologists go and sit in one village for a long time, and they, ha they, they have a high population growth rate. Each village seems to be expanding uh, quite noticeably, 
and you think, well, in each village that we go study, population's increasing, again, it doesn't make sense. Why haven't they, you know, been living that way 100,000 years, why haven't they filled up their space? Why is each village surrounded by lots of basically <laughs> unused space? And even in, in, in today, a lot of the very tropical lands are not high densely populated. We may have the image that they are, but, but, uh, but they're not. New Guinea is not densely populated. If you call densely populated, the Netherlands is, the, I think, the most densely populated in the world. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, the livable regions of China, the livable regions of Japan. These are densely populated. The, uh, the, 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 the tropical regions of the world, nothing, uh, nothing like that. Uh, New Guinea, I said, Borneo, very sparsely populated. Uh, the Amazon, Sub-Saharan Africa, vast open areas. So these are not situations of high population density, yet any village that you sit in is increasing uh, its population. And so what's going on? Um, so what are the poss So what, what the archaeologists find out is that when they study a site, and I sort of mentioned this already, what you see is this. You, uh, uh, go to, you, you start digging a site, and you, you, you actually dig in reverse, but you go to the bottom, and you see there was nobody there before certain years, and then a small population. And what you see, you, you can count the amount of food remains, all kinds of things. The population grows more or less exponentially. That means that the same percentage every year, or a, a half of a percent a year, or whatever it is, and it grows up faster and faster because you have more people <laughs> producing that same percent of population growth. So you get this phase, and then all of a sudden you reach the top of your pond, your village is gone, and there's, no, there's nothing there. So some sort of a crash happened. Or if it's not totally gone, uh, it's really knocked down tremendously. And then you either wait, look at that site again, like the biblical sites, which they dig and dig and dig, uh, and sometime later, starts up again, or, the, or a different site starts up again, and you get the same phenomenon. And for, forget this line, this is the idea of a cat, that was the carrying capacity, but nothing, as you can see, nothing fits the carrying capacity. It, it just, you know, maybe stays there for a little bit here. So the idea of carrying capacity for humans doesn't work very well. Um, so what are the reasons? So, and then the explanation for the population staying more or less constant and not filling up the space is not that each community doesn't exist, but communities, here's your space filled with community A, B, C, D, E, and as each community increases, some other community just disappears, goes out of existence. So if you measure over the whole big space, you have a floating game of different communities, each growing, but then disappearing completely, and the population in the whole space stays more or less the same. I, I don't want to push that as really comes super duper constant, but you know, more or less the same, does not fill up. So what are the reasons why a community would, would grow very happily, more or less, you know, very vaguely, exponentially, and then <laughs> go out of existence? So one is, of course, climatic disaster. Uh, there could be a freeze, uh, there could be a, a drought, uh, these, these real climatic things. And if you look at, like, the Anasazi of Arizona that live near, near the, the Colorado River, and near uh, regions, uh, one of the thought, they, they're one of the communities that fit this. They're healthy, you can go see their ruins, and then whoosh, they just disappeared. How many of you have been to the Anasazi site in Arizona? Oh, just one, one student, something you gotta do. Um, uh, and there, you're living in a semi a, a true desert now, and a semi-desert back then. So climatic things are a reasonable explanation. But you go into the tropical regions, you don't have droughts that, that last. You don't have freezes, and yet you see this same uh, kind of phenomenon. So while undoubtedly climatic things uh, happened occasionally uh, in the temperate zones, certainly in the northern zones, certainly, most hunter-gatherer societies, probably that's not the explanation. The next thing, of course, diseases of the crops, that some fungus came by and wiped out your crops. Well, we've just talked about that, that since they're eating 85 different kinds of things in the desert, <laughs> Uh, th there isn't any kind of uh, microorganism that, that cuts across species like that. So that explanation doesn't seem to work. Disease of humans, same thing, not diseases of the plants, but diseases of humans. Um, again, the data just doesn't fit that, that because of the isolation, uh, 
they don't have a huge problem with communicable uh, diseases. So that leaves the possibility of violent confrontation from one community to another. We've seen in, in the chimps how the northern group will completely wipe out the southern group and so forth. So what kind of evidence can one adduce that this might be what's going on? If one looks at any modern population and looks at the survival curve, so this is uh, the, the number of deaths per thousand per year. So in this is India, for instance, and it's fairly recent, 1960s. Bef antibiotics are just coming in at this stage. So very high infant mortality rate, uh, 80 per thousand. It's one out of every 12 kids dies like almost <coughs> immediately. And then that high rate continues until about, comes down to something about six or seven uh, years old. So a lot of your population is just wiped out immediately. Uh, and then you have a pretty low level of death and, and fairly flat until it gets to be what's considered old age in different populations. And then the death rate rises again. So you have this very standard U-shaped curve. And here, after you have sort of modern medicine, this is Sweden in the same year as the infant. Primarily, the main thing is the infant mortality <coughs> drops like crazy. And the old age stuff, er everything drops, but the main drop is in infant mortality. The idea is what I just want you to get out of this, we'll see this graph again and again a couple of times, uh, is that during the adult years, the death rate is very low compared to either here or here. Now, if you look at what we can gather from archaeological data from hunter-gatherer communities, you have uh, a, a, a high death rate of kids, not, not as high as when you get all these communicable diseases in modern societies, and then you have a flat period, and then all of a sudden there's this big bump, that there's what they call an excess mortality in exactly the young adult years. And then it comes back down again and you get a more or less normal old age situation. Well, what is it that kills people in their middle years? <laughs> Violence. <laughs> so this kind of data, again, we don't totally, we don't really know the answer, but this kind of data leads you to suspect that indeed one of the major reasons, not the only reason, but a major reason that the hunter-gatherer communities and, and the early archaeological communities disappear so suddenly is that they are wiped out by some sort of, of violence. And so we're right back in hunter-gatherer times, as far as we can tell, uh, to uh, what you've seen before of these mass, I showed you last time, these mass graves that are characteristic of this period. <coughs> okay, nevertheless, over the very long scale of time, our period of being cavemen and hunter-gatherers lasted hundreds of thousands of years, uh, but gradually, population did uh, slowly increase. And as population increases, the land available to people gets less. We'll talk, I think, next time about Africa, which has a culture in which land is not a scarce commodity. Uh, now, again, it's getting to be scarce. But in their traditions, land is not the scarce commodity. But as population grows, the land per person uh, gets less. And then you have to make a more intense utilization of the land, and farming gets invented. And a big discussion whether actually it was the population pressure that caused farming to be invented, or whether that was just some brilliant stroke by somebody that invented, that you know, people slowly figured it out. So uh, they actually can trace the, the origin of uh, agriculture to the current date is 11,700 years ago in the Middle East, in Anatolia, what's now uh, Turkey, now uh, Sort of e uh, eastern Turkey, and it expands on the average from the original sites. You can watch it expand, and it expands at one kilometer a year. That's the average, and then it eventually takes over the whole world. And so the number of people, and when you invent agriculture, the number of people that can be supported on one plot of land grows up enormously. Uh, we've seen that, and so these people become more numerous. And so in military confrontations and warlike confrontations, they're going to be dominant almost no matter what the technology is, no matter what the bravery is, if you have an awful lot more people, you're going to wipe out or push out uh, groups that don't have that kind of population density. Uh, so agriculture spreads. 
in the early days of agriculture, you don't know an awful lot uh, yet, and you probably have one crop that you really know how to grow. And uh, for instance, in uh, the Americas, the big crop was corn. That uh, most of Latin America, even to this day, lives on corn, and the, Ameri the North American Indians lived uh, a lot on corn. Of course, in Southeast Asia, a great big population, it was rice. And you basically live off most of your calories, most of your food, from one uh, single crop. So that's not very healthy, because each crop is missing something. Uh, so corn, you may know, misses lysine, one of these essential amino acids. And uh, over a very long time, the, uh, the Americans learned to a rather complicated procedure for, for boiling it in, in lime to, to extract uh, this amino acid uh, from the plant. But until that was discovered, they must have been extremely unhealthy. Rice, you know, uh, is missing all kinds of vitamins, and people have very severe vitamin deficiencies if their diet is too much uh, rice. So you're not getting a health, in early farming, you're not getting a particularly healthy diet. You're not getting the, the, mineral, the vitamins and micronutrients that, that you need. Furthermore, your food security goes down, again, as I've mentioned, that a virus or a fungus or something attacks your crops, and you know if that's 80% of your calories, and that is wiped out in a year, you're gone. Or if, or if uh, locusts come by and eat them up, or some insect infestation uh, comes through. Um, also, with increase in uh, in calorie availability, you can you can more people can stay alive, uh, and so you get dense populations. The social structure changes. Now, previously, each person could only get enough food basically for himself or maybe a very small family. As you develop the technology of agriculture, an individual can produce a surplus. Not everything he feeds. Well, who's going to get that surplus? In an, ega in an egalitarian society, he keeps the surplus himself, his family, and so forth. But there's other guys that are either stronger or nastier than you, and they come in and steal your surplus from you. And they have to leave you just with a small part of your production to just keep you alive because they want you to work for them. And so uh, you get societies now where there are classes. There are people who, in one way or another, take the excess food from the farmer and use it for other purposes, usually their own purposes. They can largely hire military to keep them in power and to protect them from other places. That's a large use of the food surplus which agriculture puts up. Also manufacturers uh, come in. They, they hire artisans to make beautiful gold objects uh, for them or, or to make uh, beds or chairs or you know, all, the, all the manufacturing starts on the agricultural surplus that agriculture brings in because an individual human now can produce more calories than he needs to keep going at a subsistence level. So what you see as agriculture progresses is hunter-gatherer societies are generally quite egalitarian. They'll more or less have a headman, but he won't, or a wise man, or an old man, but they won't have authority. He can't order other people around. The community has to agree on some project if they take undertake projects at all. As more f more uh, food wealth becomes available, societies start uh, uh, stratifying. You get social classes. You get castes. And uh, this inequality changes everything uh, about the way humans live. Um, the congestion in the cities, cities start growing up, and then you start getting the spread of these uh, infectious diseases where one person spreads it to the next in large agglomerations of humans. And that just gets worse and worse up through uh, you know, the 1400s in Europe when you get the Black Death and wipes out a huge number. That is, as as civilization progresses, the, the, the death rate from infectious diseases just keeps uh, going on up. Um, adding all this together, and, and the data we have, is that hunter-gatherers, their lifespan is ballpark 50 years. In early agricultural societies, that goes down to 35 years. So we're really, and I'll show you data that in a lot of places, it's probably even lower. Uh, than that. So we have this situation where 
human, not, not counting violence, that humans lived, when they weren't being attacked by their neighbors, humans were living very well, the hunter-gatherer society. Sort of Garden of Eden. And then agriculture comes in, and the vast mass of humans become peasants. Be the land becomes owned not by them, but by someone else. And they have to give most of what they produce to someone else. So life becomes miserable. And there's a lot of thought that the various Garden of Eden myths, I mean, ev almost every culture has some sort of glorification of a very distant path, past where people did not have to work so hard. And in, in our culture, we call it the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. Then something happened. And after the fall of one sort or another, uh, now it's the sweat of our brow. And it's a very nice description of what I've been telling you of, of the hunter-gatherers living in a lush environment before they're pushed into the desert, living quite well. Uh, and <coughs> however, uh, later on, then they have to be farmers, the sweat of the brow. And violence, like Cain and Abel, is what is the, the, the fly in the ointment of that beautiful uh, Eden story. OK. So now we come to the agricultural period in our historical romp through history. And there's certain really fundamental uh, issues uh, that you have to understand to understand what was happening with population in these times. So there's constraints on, po on human population. And the first was this enormous infant mortality, uh, which I showed you. And again, we're looking at 1960 here uh, in a very civilized place, you know, poor India in 1960, but still, even, even into the 1960s, uh, where we're very modern, uh, the infant mortality rate is enormous. <coughs> you go even currently to a less well-developed place. Uh, I just cut out this quote from uh, Haiti in 1979, before this recent rash of, of problems. A Cornell-trained Haitian comes from Haiti to Cornell, gets a medical degree, uh, returns to Haiti, and he gets a job at a pediatric hospital. 40% of the infants, of the babies, so they have the birth rates working in, a, among other things, a, a maternity clinic, 40% of the babies were dying of endemic diarrhea. A man would come to pick up the bodies three times a day with a big bag. The noise of the skulls in the bag was unbearable. And this is 1979 uh, in how far is Haiti from Miami? 150 miles or something like that. So the data, we have various data sets for what life expectancy was like. And this is various populations. Uh, and what this is is a survivorship curve. So you take for 1,000 people born in any given space of time. In an earlier period, so this is Cisalpine Gaul. This is Roman times. Uh, that's the part of Gaul that's this side of the Alps, according to them, Cisalpine Gaul. Um, out of 1,000 children born, it's, and actually this shows females, but it's more or less the same for males, uh, almost immediately half of them die. And that's very characteristic of human societies until modern sanitation comes in, which is in, in Europe, 1700s, and in Asia, maybe 1900s, um, that you have this tremendous death rate of children. And then it continues uh, at, a, at a fairly high but decreasing death rate. And then finally, there's very few people left. So this is not the curve which showed you the percentage of deaths in each age thing, but how many people are still surviving. So at any point, in by age uh, 15 here, this dotted line, only about 40% of people are still alive. 60% have died before age 15. And this, again, is women. So a lot of this death in this middle period, by the time this is the reproductive years, these dotted line is 15 to 45 or, or, or so, I think 50 in this case, which is the years in which women can reproduce. And most of the death in females in this period is childbirth itself. In a developing population, in a pre-medical population, childbirth itself is one of the most dangerous things in these years. And the death rates are very high uh, from, from childbirth itself. So a lot of that is, is uh, female, is, is childbirth. If you looked at a male population, uh, 
it might even be more extreme, uh, due to the, probably due to the violence that we've talked about. Now, as time goes on, we're going to come back to this graph, but as time goes on, this is Italy in 1921, and things have gotten at all ages, the death is less, so there's more people surviving. And then you come to Japan, again, 1984, and, and you know, very, very little infant mortality, very little mortality through this period. And then again, old age takes over and people do die. And this kind of bump here compared to, say, this is, again, possibly violence uh, in that era. But again, we don't really know. So for our purposes, going back in time, we're really interested in this lower graph, which is characteristic of humans from way back till really almost Napoleonic times, and maybe through Napoleonic times, because <coughs> the, the death of the violence in Napoleonic times was enormous. If you look at women, consider this just a graph for women, of 1,000 women born, 400 are s still alive at the beginning of their reproductive period, and about 200 are still alive at the end of their reproductive period. So if you average that out, something like, it would be the same as if something like 300 women lived throughout their reproductive period. Well, if that society is going to keep going, what is needed to happen? That these, more or less, 300 women have to reproduce 1,000 women, right? And if they reproduce 1,000 women, they also have to reproduce 1,000 boys, right? So 300 women have to give rise to 2,000 children, right? And if they don't do that, then there's fewer, fewer people in each generation, and rapidly you don't see this population anymore. So how many children is that, that each woman has to have? 300 women making 2,000 children. Six and two-thirds, almost seven. So that means that in, when you have a mortality curve like this, which again is most of human recorded history, most of human history, not counting hunter-gatherers who did live longer, apparently, uh, the absolute minimum that a society could cope with is women having basically an average of seven children. But wait a minute. I've made this a better case. That's of the... W all that this graph shows is women that are alive in this period. What fraction go infertile? What fraction have infertile husbands? What fraction never get married? What fraction are too sick to have children? What fraction of women are worn out after two or three children and can't bear many? That's also a very large number which depends on the population. So if you subtract those, let's call them infertile women for a variety of reasons in which they or their husbands or their health, they're infertile, then there's even fewer people alive. And so this curve goes, if you didn't graph just women alive, but women that are alive and in childbearing condition, the curve gets much lower. So the number of children that women, the women that were physically capable of it, uh, had to have in these pre-modern times was more than seven, and probably eight or nine, or you know, you have to do the calculation and uh, people don't know how to, how to evaluate the, what fraction of Roman women were fertile or, or infertile. So you can't calculate that. So we have a, a huge problem that, um, that somehow there must, be there must be mechanisms to ensure that no women are wasted, that any woman that can reproduce does reproduce, and when they reproduce, they go at it. <laughs> They just keep going and going. And of course, men have an equal part. Well, they don't do the amount of work, but they have a, a, a part in it. So, um, and as I said, this level of mortality continues into quite modern times. It's, 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 it's quite striking. Europe got out of it a little bit earlier, I say somewhere in the 1700s. But for instance, in uh, 1912, in Australia, we have an Australian TA. Is she here today? Yeah. Went to the got a ticket to the inauguration. 1912 Australian census shows that 60% of all children born died unmarried. So that's this number. We have them, well, it's about the same number as this. Four, this shows that only 40% are left, and this says in Australia 60% are dead. So that's, that's the same number. 60% uh, of children born died unmarried. And among the married, one-ninth of marriages were sterile. 
and just 11% of the men and 14% of the women produced half of the children. So uh, that means those that could reproduce were married and et cetera, had to really have very, very high birth rates as late as 1912. China, as late as 1930, uh, had a nearly aboriginal uh, birth and death rate. Uh, the total fertility level was at these levels of, of six, seven, eight, eight, eight children uh, per woman, yet the population was not increasing, which means the death rate was just as high, and they were in this kind of a situation for reproduction. We're going to talk a lot about China later, uh, of course. Uh, at that death rate, and this is data for China, in order to have a 50% certainty, so as, as you know, uh, many cultures, and Chinese included in, in, in traditional times, s for sure wanted at least one child uh, to survive. And so they do a calculation at this death rate, how many children is the minimum you have to have to give yourself a 50% chance of having one son survive? Five children. So if you're not thinking of reproducing the population, but just reproducing your own family, which is the way individual families think, and, and they, they have to have a son, and you have this mortality rate, at five children, you have a 50% chance. If you want to have a 80% chance or something, <coughs> you're back up to eight, nine, 10 children, which explains the, <coughs> the, the desire, not necessarily they don't necessarily keep this birth rate, but the desire for these very, very high birth rates. So the result is that in most uh, pre-modern societies, women spend their whole post-pubertal lives either pregnant or lactating. There's basically never a time when they're free of the, bio the biological uh, aspects of childbearing, not, not counting the, 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 the children that are, that are now not breastfeeding anymore that Bonnie was talking about. So for instance, in Bangladesh in the 1990s, we're coming up very close, 75% of the women in the age group of 20 to 39 were either pregnant or lactating. So that means four out of every five women were at that moment, any moment that you look, they're either pregnant or, or breastfeeding. And there's a small period in which they rest and then it, it starts over again. So we're not talking, in, in, in the need for these very high birth rates, we're not just talking about primitive tribes by, by any means, we're talking about the period in which all the world's great civilizations developed. And civilization, one of the things that civilizations had to do was ensure a birth rate like this. And in the, in the period in which uh, cultures were learning to write and, and, and producing their classic literatures and developing the great world religions, all of these, if, if you read through them, are, are, calcul are calculated in some sense to keep fertility high. All of these things glorify high fertility, uh, the, the religious doctrines uh, uh, push it, um, there's community sanctions, the cultures just develop in a way uh, that in order to increase fertility. And any culture that doesn't do that and doesn't increase it successfully, they're just not here anymore. And of course, most cultures that you read about are not here anymore. They were not, not successful. In our uh, Western culture, the, the most uh, famous of, of these things is the first commandment in the Bible. It meant be fruitful and multiply. Well, that, that fits us. If you didn't do that, the Hebrews would be gone, and we wouldn't have any of what we, we, we currently have in terms of religion, any kind of the monotheistic religions. Um, so there's all kinds, and you look at the, the culture, the religious tradition of any culture, you'll find all kinds of laws about regulating sexuality. Uh, now, Yale students don't know much about the Bible. How many of you know, you know masturbation is supposed to be a bad thing, and do you know what in the Bible is supposed to prohibit that? What? Sin of Onan spilling seed. Yes. So it's the story of Onan spilling his seed. And do you know why he was spilling his seed? Or what the situation is? It, there's different versions. One is that he was having sex with his brother's wife and he didn't want her impregnate her. Why was he having sex? So this, she said she, he was having sex with his brother's wife and didn't want to impregnate her. That's correct.
we would always pull out and spill the seed on the ground, and God said that's immoral, and Chuck and Jim. Right. <laughs> Exactly correct. I have to repeat that this for, 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 for the camera. So the, the situation is a very short passage, very interesting passage, uh, and uh, it's giving out various more, more, it's in a section giving out moral laws, and it says uh, someone had sons, and one of them was Ur, and Ur was married, and Ur died. It doesn't say much about Ur except that he died. Onan was the next brother. Repeated in the Old Testament many times is that if a man's, brother a, man, a man's brother dies, he has the, the moral obligation to inseminate the sister, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the sister-in-law, in order to secure an heir for the dead brother. That if he, if he fathers a child with his sister-in-law, then that is not considered his child, uh, it is considered the dead brother's child. And that's one of these important things of carrying on the family lines, which is one of the ways of, of course, in ensuring a high population birth rate. That, so uh, this is a way of keeping women, whether they're married or not, whether their husband is dead or not, you've got to keep them reproducing or the, the culture disappears. So why doesn't Ur want to do this? Uh, why doesn't Onan want to do this? Well, he may or may not. It's not his kids, so, you know, born. So there's none of this sort of... Uh, power and authority and, and macho stature to come with having a lot of kids, because it's the brother's kid, and the culture it's, was the brother's kid. But on top of that, he would have to support this kid. That economically, he would have to support not only the wife, but the kid. And he didn't want to have to support kids that weren't his. So he engaged in the sex act, because that was the fun part of it, and, but at the last minute, he pulls out and spills the seed upon the ground. And then the, the Bible passage is very curt, it doesn't say more, it says he's not, and then God killed him. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of explanation for this. But it's repeated, this particular law, the, called the Levirate laws, as the uh, student said, is repeated in several places in the Bible, and it's very, very clear that people didn't do this. People did not, insemin did not want to inseminate their, their, their brothers' wives because of these reasons. And so whenever you see a law sort of demanding something over and over again, you know people weren't doing it, <laughs> and that's why the law is, is demanding it. So that's just one example of uh, how uh, religion gets involved in enforcing fertility. And in this picture example, it's one of the mechanisms for keeping every woman pregnant as much of the time uh, as possible, independent of her state uh, of marriage. So the, uh, anybody know why uh, the Muslims took to polygamy? Why Muhammad allowed four wives? No Muslims in the class? Like, free women from slavery. What? It's free women from slavery. No. The standard version is they were going through a lot of wars. The Muslims were conquering the whole world. They were constantly at war. The men were getting killed. There weren't enough men. <laughs> so what do you do with the other women? They, they, I mean, many reasons, but one of, they, they need support. And so it's, it's a, beneficial thing, but the society needed more men, more children, so let, let them get married uh, multiply. And you just, whatever religion you want to look at, you'll find similar kinds uh, of examples. When we get to uh, uh, family planning issues later, later on, pe how, how people control their, their reproduction, one of the major beliefs that the Earl, we don't really know again, but in the West was that the mechanism people used was coitus interruptus because it's the only thing they knew about. Because it's in the Bible, it tells you what you do, it tells you the result of it. <laughs> and so that Onan passage is currently interpreted to uh, say that masturbation and, and contraception, all kinds of things, are bad, when in fact the passage has nothing to do with that. That's not what that passage is about, but that's what it's used for today. But it's been used absolutely for the opposite. People use this, oh, that's how I can avoid having children. <laughs> And so it's, it's culture twists itself about and has unexpected consequences. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I've been stressing for you um, that culture pushes up fertility and up to this uh, high limit. But what is the limit of human uh, fertility? So we have to uh, evaluate that. And um, so there's a very famous calculation of this, and it's said by the number of years a woman is fertile, which is generally 
15 to 45, more or less, can be a little bit younger, occasionally a little bit older, but they usually consider uh, 30, uh, 30 or so years of fertility. Uh, and at that, well, if she gets me, she's going to be pregnant for nine months. Uh, ovulation rarely starts again before uh, at least three months. If she's uh, lactating uh, and, and therefore going through not, not ovulating again, that's going to be more months. Uh, if a woman has sexual intercourse, it takes an average of five cycles to get pregnant. We'll talk, when we talk about abortion, we'll talk about why that is. But if a woman is having normal sex trying to get pregnant, the average is five months uh, before she actually does get pregnant. And we'll, we'll see where that comes from. Uh, if the child dies, fetal mortality introduces a month there. Anyway, you, all, you add all of this up and you get uh, 18 months. That, that the, sort of pretty much the maximum that, that human females can do is 18 months or one and a half years. So dividing, what they usually do is choose 20, any particular woman will probably be fertile for 25 years. You divide that by 18 months and you get a theoretical possibility of 16.7 children, right? Now, uh, <laughs> how many of you know somebody who's had more than that? What's the maximum number of children you know about? 18, I'm bit 18. <laughs> it's only one in the class. I think the world record for women is somewhere really high. It's much higher than 18. I heard it was like in the 60s. How many? I thought it was like in the 60s. But she oh, no, no, not 60. No, nothing. That, that's really crazy. Unless there's some crazy multiple birth. Yeah. Now, with modern, modern uh, drugs, sometimes there's multiple, but no, not 60. So this is an unusual class. But as time goes on, families get smaller, and people don't remember. Uh, the maximum I got out of this class was 24 children. One, I think it was a Chinese student, I don't totally remember. And that 24 was only two sets of twins. So there are 22 separate successful pregnancies, two of which produced twins, 24 children, uh, one woman. And even, forget this, uh, independent of this calculation, which I've just sort of sketched for you, uh, at the, uh, even before the calculation was done and the person did the calculation knew about it, Oh, this is not, oh, yeah. Here is the, the, uh, the, the uh, Norway in uh, an earlier set of women, which is this set and a later set of women. And this is the number of children that the women have and the percentage, the per thousand uh, of women that had that number. So in the 18, late 1880s, the, uh, the, the most common number from Norway, again, we're talking Norway 1890, we're not talking about any, anything very pr anything primitive, is 10 children. The, the, the mode for Norway that was 10 children, and it goes out to 18, which was the record that someone here knew. And there were, of course, if you had a bigger sample, you'd get an occasional something more. The world record is 69 children. Oh, what does it say? Hmm? Good for him. Good for him. <laughs> and what, 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 that's something special. Does it say anything about it? <laughs> oh, okay, so it was, it was, and what was the total number of, yeah, so, okay, I was wrong. S send me, both of you, se send me the reference, send me the reference for that, because next year I'll use it. <laughs> um, so, and now just as long as I've got this slide up there, look what changes. So we go from 40 years later, not a huge fraction of time, we're going to talk about this later in the class. It goes from the mode being 10 children to the mode being 2 children. There's something drastic happens in between these two uh, in, f in 40 years. And this is common over Europe. This is just one, one data set. And we're going to talk about that a lot, but since it's up here. So in this period of time that we're talking about, women had this very, un uh, in the mode, this very large number of children, and they far exceeded uh, the, what's calculated as, as, the, as the maximum. Um, let's see. Okay. So the answer is that the biological limit is very high. Yeah. I'll say 24, you say 69, we have to read that stuff. So <coughs> in a human population, that con and continuing for any length of time, the highest well-documented fertility is that of the Hutterites in the 1920s. Anybody hear of Hutterites? It's a, it's a Christian religious sect that or origin in what's called an Anabaptist sect 
that originated in Europe migrates here. They're in the upper Midwest, in uh, North Dakota and going on over in, into Canada. And they're very successful in, in both economic ways and in population uh, ways. Uh, they marry fairly early, not extremely early, but fairly early. They have a good diet. They're farmers and very productive farmers. And they have good medical care. They engage in sex uh, regularly. Uh, they're supposed to. And uh, their religion forbids contraception or abortion. And not only do they have the, they obey these rules. And many, many people have those rules in the books, but this, this is a very religious group, and, and they, they obey the rules. Their uh, what we call total fertility rate, which at this moment you can consider the average number of children that a woman in that society would have, was 12.4 children. Nothing that's high, you, you think that's high, I saw someone blanch here <laughs> as an average children, but nothing like the, the, like the 24 or 69 that we're talking about. So this is the highest human population that we have documented can have that, and it's nowhere near uh, any kind of calculation uh, for, for a limit. And uh, the most usual limit, you see a lot of cultures in at least some part of the history where the, the uh, eight is, is current cultures where, or, or historical cultures where eight is kind of a, a maintained uh, average. So in the colonial United States, for instance, for a short time when the frontier was wide open, they had a fertility rate of eight children uh, per women. And, uh, but as soon as the frontier would close in a region, uh, the fertility rate uh, would drop. So it was clearly land availability had something to do with it. And there's good data for Massachusetts, uh, Concord, Massachusetts, very good demographic data there. People had these high birth rates until the frontier closed. So what did the frontier mean in the 1600s in Massachusetts? It meant like Springfield. <laughs> you know, these were people living in Plymouth and Concord and Lexington, right near the coast, and the frontier was Springfield. And as soon as, so if they had a lot of children, the children would have to move out to Springfield or somewhere which is, what, 100 miles or so, something like that. And that was beyond the frontier. And as soon as the children had to move more than a day's uh, horse ride away, the fertility rate drops. So there's something about having the support of your children really having a group that increases the fertility. And as soon as the children will have to disperse and not anymore be of some sort of support to you or some part of your group, fertility uh, comes back down. So no society really has, er has ever come close to uh, the biological <coughs> limit. So before we talked about how culture pushes up the birth rate, but now we see that something is pushing down the birth rate, that we're coming to uh, an intermediate level. And what's going on is, again, fairly straightforward and simple that, I think it was, come on, this slide that I want. Here is, uh, again, fairly recent data. Chinese women interviewed in 1980 in 81, but re referring to their pregnancies, which had been some time in the past. And it says, it tried to gather data on what was the birth interval of your children and how many of them survived. So if the birth interval was less than two years, 45% of the children died. If it was between two and three years, 34% of the children died. If it was more than three years, only 19% only of the children died. So in every culture and every time and place where we have data like this, it's very clear that if the birth interval is too small, the children just don't survive. So what's going on with pushing down uh, the fertility rate is that, it, especially in situations of, of poverty where resources are not great, women are not especially healthy, there's no any kind of medicine available, that if the child does not get a lot of resources, which in large cases milk from the mother is, is, is the primary thing, because there's, in like China, there's no dairy products at, at this time in this social class. Uh, it's largely food directly from the mother. Uh, the children are just going to die. So the reason that fertility is, although pushed up from below, is pushed down, is not to reduce total uh, number of children, but to maximize surviving fertility. What people aim at is not to just keep popping them out and having them die. What people aim at and, and cultures have learned to accommodate to is to maximize surviving fertility, not total fertility, which is just being born, 
Uh, but maximizing the number of children that are going to stay alive to become uh, uh, adult reproducing members of the society. Now, people have many mechanisms for limiting the birth rate. Uh, one that is uh, often quite conscious is breastfeeding. It's a very standard method across many cultures. Uh, you've all heard of this, lactational amenorrhea, and uh, many, many cultures don't leave. I mean, in our culture, a woman can breastfeed a little bit or a long. It's totally up to the individual. Many cultures have very strict uh, rules about this. You must breastfeed for at least, and, and there's a certain uh, period of time. And among the Kung of, of uh, Southwest Africa, which are these people that speak this click language, you know, they've got all these, you've heard of them. Uh, mothers keep the infant with them at all times. They nurse all day, an interval separated by only 15 minutes. And uh, Bonnie, how would you like to have that all day long? Nurse every 15 minutes the child. They sleep next to the mother and have access to her breast all night long. And the, con the nursing continues until the child is more than three years old. And so by that mechanism, primarily by the lactational amenorrhea, uh, the, the birth interval among Kong is four years, which fits, is beyond this survival issue. And this is the kind of, I talked about nomads and, and people that, ones that have fairly conscious, they probably are aware that this is limiting their births and it's a thing uh, that they want to do. Uh, so when the women go foraging, uh, they carry their, ch and again the Kung, uh, they carry their children uh, with them until they're four years old. And while carrying the infant, she walks up to 12 miles round trip to forward, take six miles to go out and find some food and, and, and come back, 12 miles round trip. And then in addition to that, she carries loads of 15 to 35 pounds. So here's a woman who, being hunter-gatherer, is probably fairly healthy. She's carrying an infant on her back, walking around 12 miles, and coming back with a load of 35 pounds of, of, of food. It's quite a, quite a feat, and uh, it's clear that they can't, you know, they're not going to have a second infant, you know, one on the back, one on the hip. This, this is not a, a way of in improving survival. So, one, so that's, uh, po uh, lactation is, is one mechanism. Uh, there's many taboos on sexual relations, especially after birth. Uh, so in many cultures, there's, a, a, there's, as I said, a prescribed period of nursing. There's also a postpartum taboo against having sexual uh, relations. And again, another obvious mechanism for birth uh, spacing. And if you, and Again, this gets to the degree of consciousness of these, of these methods. Uh, if you ask a member of, of a society that has a taboo, uh, they report, for instance, that sex at that time is very dangerous, uh, a life and death matter. Uh, it is dangerous to mix the man's blood with the woman's, and the man's blood is transmitted through his semen. It's a bodily fluid, and they don't totally, you know, the biology is not very strong. Their course at Yale was terrible. <laughs> and so they, they, we'll, we'll talk a lot about not a lot, some about what pre-education pre pre people believe about uh, reproduction and everything. And, it, and, uh, and if man's blood gets into the woman through his semen, then it also gets into her, her milk, and then the man's blood goes back into the baby through the mother's milk, and this is a poison for the baby. So that's, that's their version of why they, shouldn't, why they have this taboo. And we see this in the evolution of cultures. I mean, just as we evolve biologically, we of course evolve culturally, that cultures may, will pick up a behavioral pattern for who knows what reason. And they may have no clue what its real, quote, as we see it, its real purpose is, in this case to, to space births apart. They have some kind of cultural story about it, and it doesn't matter whether that cultural story has any degree of reality. If they've picked up a cultural norm that works, the society is still here, and that gets passed on. If that cultural practice does not work, not only reproduction, all sorts of ways, that society I is gone. Um, so uh, this postpartum abstinence is, is a major uh, issue, especially in Africa now. Uh, 
The abstinence is up to three years, uh, it, which is, that's, the com that's sort of the mode of, of this in, in Africa. In addition to, to limit uh, births, there's another thing, which again is a population limitation issue, because we've talked about individual family limitation issue, trying to keep the kid alive. If the village is uh, resource limited, they may have mechanisms for keeping the whole population of the whole village down. And so in Africa especially, they have a thing called terminal abstinence. That means at a certain point in life, the culture demands that you stop having sexual relations. And very often, this is when your daughter has her first child. After that, you're a grandmother, and you're not supposed to reproduce anymore. And it's interesting what, what the reason for it, to prevent, con they perceive it as preventing conflicts between their duties as mother and their duties as grandmother. So grandmother is supposed to help raise the grandchildren, and there's a lot of biological theory about why do humans, somewhat unique among animals, why don't we just die, we females especially, after the fertile period? There's no reason for you to evolutionarily stay alive. You know, in most animals, they don't have a postmenopausal period. And the, an and th the theoretical reason is the grandmother effect, that as a grandmother, you support the, the children of your child, and that increases their survival, and so it's evolutionarily good. And here, in these tribes in Africa, are basically saying the same thing, that if you're a grandmother, you're gonna have a conflict between taking care of your own children, taking care of your daughter's children, and that conflict is bad, so you have to not engage in sexuality. Up to the middle of the 1900s, uh, in Ireland, rural Ireland, people lived in, hou in households with uh, many members of both sexes and several generations, big multi-family multi houses. And the Irish believed that there should be only one sexually active procreative couple in a household. So they also practiced grandmother abstinence. So these cultural items are, you know, they may seem a little outlandish to us in our modern day, but they were effective. They, they, they kept that society going. Um, and another issue is exogamy, that just like chimpanzees, it's, again, in most animals, it's the males that disperse, but in chimps and humans, it's the females that disperse. Uh, the females leave the community at birth, time marriage, and go live with the man's family. And so she's under the control then, in many cultures, basically a slave, to the son's family, and the reproductive rules are then set by the son's family, and she has no uh, choice in this. And, uh, We'll talk about that extra. So this outmarrying, uh, so remember with chimpanzees, we're hostile to the neighbors around us. Human societies are that same way. So the n I have a lab in Klein. The professor in the next lab to me is from China, a village near Shanghai. And he describes this to me in China, that he says, my village, which is all the same name as him, it's all a, a male bonded, pa you know, patrilineal, the males have been there forever, they all have the same last name. They are hostile to all the villages around them. So they won't marry the village around them. To get married, they have to go two villages away. And they're still sort of enemies. And in New Guinea, where, you know, all over the world, that's the same problem. You're fighting with your neighbors, and yet you have to get wives from somewhere. You have to, uh, you know, exchange genetic material, otherwise you get inbreeding. And so uh, the Mayanga, they say in New Guinea, that we marry our enemies. And, Oh, this is a great story. Uh, time is up. I will continue this story next time. <laughs> <laughs>